Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Fluorophoric Fundamentals for Flow Cytometry. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more, visit them at thermofisher.com. Now, we encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you might have during this presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education window at the bottom of your screen to obtain those credits. I'd now like to welcome our speaker, Jolene Bradford, an Associate Director and Strategic Collaborations at Biosciences Division at Thermo Fisher Scientific. Jolene, welcome. You may now begin your presentation. Great. Well, thanks for the introduction, and I'm glad to have you all join me today to explore the fundamentals of fluorescence in flow cytometry. So Thermo Fisher is a world leader in serving science and have solutions to offer for the full flow cytometry workflow. This is our agenda for today's presentation, beginning with basics of fluorescence, briefly looking at the differences between conventional and full spectrum flow cytometry, and then looking in detail at different types of fluorophores. So flow cytometry uh, works by passing thousands of cells per second through a laser beam and then capturing the light that emerges from each cell as it passes through the instrument. The ability to perform measurements on single cells, um, thousands or even millions of cells in a sample, makes flow cytometry one of the most powerful platforms available today. Most of the measurements that come in flow cytometry use fluorescent labels, and the main components are fluidics, optics, and electronics. So here we see the electromagnetic spectrum with visible wavelengths and their corresponding colors highlighted. Fluorophores generally emit within the visible light portion of the spectrum, but we have been using the UV area for decades, which are the shorter wavelengths, and in more recent years, the near IR portion, which are the longer wavelengths. Flow cytometry is dependent on the control, collection, and separation of light. There is an inverse relationship between energy and wavelength. Uh, the shorter wavelengths of light will have higher energy, while the longer wavelengths will have lower energy. So a fluorophore is a molecule that is capable of fluorescing. In its ground state, uh, the fluorophore is in a stable configuration and it does not fluoresce. When light from an external source, such as a laser, hits a fluorophore, um, the molecule absorbs the light energy. When the energy is absorbed and it is sufficient, uh, the molecule reaches a higher energy state, and this is called the excited state. And the process is called excitation. And the ne next thing is the fluorophore will uh, rearrange itself from this semi-stable excited state back to the ground state. And with this, excess energy is released, which is emitted back as light. And the emitted light is of a lower energy and thus a longer wavelength than the absorbed light. And this is a cyclic process, and it could be summarized as the excitation of a fluorophore through the absorption of light energy, a transient excited lifetime with some loss of energy, and then return of the fluorophore to its ground state, which is accompanied by the emission of light. Uh, the Stoke shift 
is the term that's used to describe the difference in wavelengths at which a molecule emits light relative to the wavelength at which it was excited, or the difference between the absorption max and the emission max. So fluorophores absorb across a range of wavelengths, and this is called the excitation range. They emit across a, wave, a range of wavelengths as well, and this is called uh, the emission range. Within each of these ranges, there is an excitation maximum and an emission maximum where the fluorescent molecule uh, maximally excite or maximally emit. Because excitation and emission wavelengths are different, the absorbed and emitted light are detected as different colors. Um, excitation and emission, because it occurs across this broad range of wavelengths, um, the, the intensity may change. So it's important to understand that while the illumination at the excitation max of the fluorophore produces the greatest fluorescence output, illumination at lower or higher wavelengths affects only the intensity of the emitted light and the range and overall shape of the emission profile is unchanged. So it's useful to view the excitation and emission curves to better understand fluorophore properties. And this uh, includes the full absorption and emission curves, not just the maximum. So I have four that are shown here. Uh, this information can be paired with your instrument configuration to best understand which fluorophores can be detected and how to select uh, compatible dyes. Using a fluorescent spectra viewer, here we see the emission profiles of two common dyes, Alexafluor 488 and Alexafluor 647, with commonly used detector bandpass filters uh, that are commonly used in uh, conventional compensation-based uh, instruments. You note that the fluorescence is only collected within the range of the bandpass filter, and there's one fluorophore per one filter. And so this means that only a portion of the fluorescence emission is collected. Using a, a fluorescent spectra viewer, we see the emission profiles of these same two dyes, but diagramming how the entire or full emission profile is collected using multiple detectors. And full spectrum flow cytometry uses uh, this information that is collected from uh, many detectors uh, across the emission range. So here's an example of uh, the FITSI fluorophore, and here we see uh, the emission profile. And here, the, the conventional flow cytometry, uh, we see only a section of the emission is collected with uh, one filter. But with a full spectrum, multiple detectors are used to collect the full fluorescence emission. So looking at an example of Alexafluor 647 and APC, uh, when these are used together in a conventional system, it's just not recommended because they are so close in their uh, emission. But when we look at the full spectrum signature, we can observe differences between the two that are visible, meaning these two fluorophores might be unmixed and you could potentially use them together. Uh, intrinsic fluorophore brightness is an important characteristic of each fluorophore and uh, should be taken into consideration when choosing fluorophores, even for basic panels. Uh, brightness depends on the capacity to absorb energy, which is called the extinction coefficient, and on the ability to convert that energy into an emitted signal, and this is called the quantum yield. It's important to understand your instrument optical configuration and characterize uh, compatible fluorophores. And then uh, antigen density 
or the expression of the target molecules in your cells is also a major consideration when choosing which fluorophore uh, to pair with which antigen. So a characterization of the instrument being used, uh, I mentioned, is a critical component of the experimental design. And this needs to be done on the specific uh, instrument and uh, model with lasers and detectors um, that you are using. So often it is useful to compare results of the same target to look at fluorescent intensity of the different fluorophores. Uh, and this is typically done with a CD4 clone of many fluorophores as shown here. And then you can get a ranking of uh, brightness levels. So now that we have reviewed the basics, let's start looking at uh, specific fluorophore information. Uh, we began this with uh, uh, fluorescent proteins and we are all aware of the, the very noble beginning of fluorescent proteins. Uh, these are proteins that give off light, uh, including chemilumescent proteins like luciferases, as well as uh, fluorescent proteins like uh, GFP. Uh, so the, the power lies in the clever ways that scientists have adapted these for use in the laboratory. So here we see GFP, uh, this is a green fluorescent protein and it has really led the way for use of fluorescent proteins. Uh, the fluorochrome is inside a barrel-like structure and this structure makes the protein very stable. Uh, however, GFP is sensitive to alcohol fixation where fluorescence is lost. Uh, with the rapid evolution of uh, protein technology, um, the utility of genetically encoded fluorophores for a wide variety of applications is just now being realized. And uh, fluorescent proteins have become one of the most important tools in contemporary uh, research. Uh, so these are incorporated as protein markers by infusing a fluorescent protein gene to your target gene. And the host cell will then produce the target protein and the fluorescent marker permanently attached. So there is, there is no need to add a separate fluorescent dye to the, the sample. And when starting out, um, GFP is a really good choice. Uh, so here we see um, an example of uh, how GFP is being used. Uh, this can be done with transfected cell lines, transgenic animals, animals, stable cell lines, and even CRISPR modified cell lines uh, using a variety of applications. In this particular example, we see U2OS cells, which have been transduced with a dilution of a uh, Bachmann light reagent. And you can see the dilution series expressed by imaging on the left. And in flow cytometry, we're running those same samples, and we can do an overlay of the different fluorescence uh, readouts. Uh, fluorescent proteins. Uh, are typically classified by their emission color. And um, there's many different types of fluorescent proteins. Uh, so this is uh, just a, a guide on uh, the colors and the wavelength ranges. Recommendations for flow cytometry will of course depend upon uh, the instrumentation you have to make sure they have the proper uh, excitation and emission uh, optics. But uh, these are some that have uh, been used in flow cytometry successfully. And if you're looking for resources to look at fluorescent proteins in flow cytometry, uh, here are some websites that are available and a very nice publication uh, in current protocols in cytometry. 
So some of the advantages, um, there's just a wide range of uh, fluorescent protein choices. Uh, they're very easy to work with. They're less perturbing to cell function. Um, there are thousands of publications useful across many platforms. And there may be um, some uh, opportunity with uh, full spectrum flow cytometry to exploit this uh, even further. Some of the challenges include uh, loss of fluorescence upon fixation, uh, their large size and variable brightness. They may produce autofluorescence in some areas of the spectrum and may require some non-standard lasers or filter sets. Uh, most of the options involve molecular biology transfection techniques and a transfection efficiency is rarely 100%. So, uh, and the final thing is if uh, you are using more than one fluorescent protein in a flow cytometry experiment, uh, we do require single color fluorescent proteins uh, for uh, doing compensation and or unmixing. So let's go on to the next class of fluorescent proteins, and these are the phycobilly proteins. Uh, this is another class derived from uh, phycobilly proteins found in algae and plants. And uh, these harvest light, uh, so a PE, APC, and PERCP are used uh, fairly extensive extensively in flow cytometry, and they are among some of the brightest fluorescent molecules available. So PE, or phycoerythrin, is a fluorescence-based indicator of cyanobacteria. It has a, a fairly large stoke shift, stoke shift with extremely high emission quantum yield. Um, it's protected uh, by the covalent binding of the protein backbone, so the fluorescence is not quenched. Um, it's water-soluble. There's multiple sites available for conjugation. Then we have APC, um, and this is isolated from uh, various species of algae. Uh, this also has a very large stoke shift and a very high quantum yield. It's protected uh, backbone and again, water soluble and uh, stable for conjugation. And finally, PERCP. Um, this again has a large stoke shift with a high extinction coefficient. Um, it is uh, highly water soluble. Uh, we do recommend a lower laser power uh, to avoid photo bleaching of PERCP, and it is best used using a blue 48 uh, excitation source. So some of the advantages are, you know, these, these uh, phycobilly proteins are very bright with a high quantum yield. They are a standard fit for conventional flow cytometers. There's a large stoke shift. Uh, they're water-soluble, they're good donors for tandem constructs, and they are available in a wide variety of antibody conjugates. Some of the challenges are that uh, the large size may limit some applications, they're quick to photo bleach, they're used uh, mainly in flow cytometry, and uh, it may be more difficult to conjugate than uh, organic reactive dyes. So now let's move on and talk about small organic dyes. And as dye chemistry is continually advantage, advancing, there are really hundreds and hundreds of dyes available. Uh, so here uh, we see uh, organic dyes. You know, this is a, a broad class of relatively small fluorescent compounds. Uh, some examples are uh, fluorescein and coumarin and their derivatives, um, the alexafluor dye series, efluor dye series, bodipi dyes, and uh, we can go on and on. Um, these small organic dyes are often based around xanthine dyes, 
And these molecules contain at least uh, one conjugated double bond system in, in rings or chains or a combination of both that is uh, perturbed upon excitation. Uh, so naming of these dyes, there's a number of different uh, conventions. For example, here we see the alexophore dyes, and these are named for the excitation wavelength. And uh, the efflor dyes are instead named for the emission wavelength. So what makes a, a good dye and a, a good probe? Well, from a, a chemist's perspective, uh, you're, you're really looking at quantum yield and extinction coefficient. But from a biologi bi biologist perspective, um, you want to look at does it match the system that you want to detect it in, you know, lasers and detectors, bandpasses, et cetera. Uh, can it be functionalized or conjugated? Is it uh, stable uh, in the environment? And you know, does it work within uh, standard uh, protocols? So uh, all of these things are looked at when we're developing new dyes. And uh, this does really require a partnership between uh, the chemist and the biologist to develop. So advantages of uh, small organic dyes is these are relatively stable. There's lots of excitation and emission profiles to choose from. They're easy to conjugate. They're very good acceptor dyes for tandem constructs. Very good for intracellular labeling. Also good for imaging applications. In flow cytometry, they're available with a, a number of antibody targets. Um, they're easy to multiplex, and they are a good fit for both conventional and spectral flow cytometry. Some of the challenges, uh, there may be a loss of signal with fixation. Uh, one of the uh, most uh, important dyes, FITSI, uh, is pH sensitive, so that's uh, uh, information that's good to know. These typically have small stoke shift with um, aset a symmetrical emission. So now let's move on and talk about uh, nanocrystals. So the size of a Q dot nanocrystal is in the region of other proteins used for cellular labeling, such as GFP or uh, PE. But these particles fluoresce in a completely different way than do traditional fluorophores. So the Q dot nanocrystals contain a semiconductor material, which has been coated with additional uh, semiconductor shell to improve optical properties of the material. Uh, the nanocrystal core is about uh, 2 to 10 nanometers in diameter but it must be coded for it to function properly in an aqueous environment, giving the particle a much larger size. So the core of the nanocrystal determines its emission color. The shell improves bite brightness and improves stability. Hydrophilic, hydrophobic coating also provides stability. And then the uh, amplophilic polymer gives water solubility. And then finally, there's a peg to reduce nonspecific interactions and provide reactive groups for conjugation. So fundamentally, uh, Q dot nanocrystals are fluorophores, substances that absorb photons of light and re-emit photons at different wavelengths. How they However, they exhibit some important differences as compared to some of the traditional fluorophores. Um, these are uh, excited by every wavelength of light up to its emission. And the emission from Q dots is uh, very narrow and symmetric. And because of the emission is so narrow and symmetric, the uh, overlap with other colors is minimal. Really, uh, yielding less uh, spillover or spread of emission. Uh, the extinction coefficient shown here on the y-axis is also an absolute measure of you know, the 
we talked about the ability to absorb light. And you can notice here that the quantum dots uh, increase their absorbance dramatically as you move into the violet and UV regions. So advantages is these are uh, very bright with a high quantum yield, very photostable, large uh, stoke shift, and narrow emission peaks, compatible with standard workflows. And these do provide unique spectra that's useful for uh, spectral flow cytometry. Some of the challenges are these Large size may limit applications, and currently these are best used for surface labeling only. Uh, the broad excitation range may limit uh, use in conventional systems, and there is a limited antibody conjugates available. So now let's move on and talk about tandem dyes. So when two uh, fluorophores are coupled together in close association, this creates uh, a tandem dye. Uh, they're bound by a covalent bond. And uh, this is a process in which uh, a fluorescent molecule can be excited and then transfer the energy to a nearby fluorescent molecule, which then emits. And this is um, FRET. Uh, the donor and acceptor dyes have to be in very close proximity, and the absorption of the acceptor must overlap the fluorescence emission of the donor. These are not naturally occurring. So uh, tandem dyes are created uh, to produce these molecules with very long stoke shift. And so a fluorescent protein or a polymer are used as the donor molecule, and small organic dyes are generally used as acceptor molecules. And as the um, excitation uh, excites the donor molecule and then it emits a longer wavelength, this emitted energy from the donor excites the acceptor molecule and uh, this creates emission at an even uh, longer wavelength. Um, efficiencies of the tandem dye is still dependent on the efficiency of the energy transfer. And while um, fret energy is high, uh, when fret energy is high, we will see a strong signal in the acceptor channel and a very weak signal in the donor channel. Um, these were made to get more colors off of a single laser, enabling emissions that are uh, given artificially to give you a longer stoke shift. So examples of this are uh, a PE Psi 7 molecule. So this is uh, combining the phycourethrin and the cyanin 7 together in a tandem construct, and you will be exciting the uh, PE molecule and gathering fluorescence from the Psi-7. And here is an example of using APC as the donor dye and an Alexafluor 750 a small molecule as the um, acceptor dye. And here is an example of using PER-CP as the donor dye and Cyanin 5.5 as the um, acceptor dye. And as mentioned before, PER-CP is best used uh, using the 488 laser. So advantages of tandems are uh, a long, very large stoke shift. Uh, this opens up regions of the spectrum previously unavailable and gives us more fluorophores to choose from. There are a variety and range of tandem dyes. Uh, polymer dyes can also be used as a donor, and these are available in a wide variety of antibody conjugates. Uh, some of the challenges is the large size may limit applications. These are used mainly in flow cytometry. It can be more difficult to conjugate than organic dyes. Um, they are photosensitive, so this does mean uh, that we need to minimize exposure to light. And um, the storage uh, is critical, both storage uh, being protected from light as well as temperature. And there is 
uh, more lot to lot variation and uh, can be, uh, you can also see cross laser excitation. So polymer dyes, these are a different type of uh, fluorophore. And here we see super bright 436 and brilliant violet 421 as examples of a general polymer format. We see uh, a polymer that consists of multiple repeating fluorescent subunits that act as a single fluorophore. Uh, these polymers absorb energy and convert uh, to an emitted signal with high efficiency. And so this results in a, a very uh, bright signal. And any subunit can absorb the light and then transmit the energy along the backbone for release. These can also uh, be used in a tandem construct where uh, the polymer acts as the donor dye and the energy transfers to an acceptor dye. So uh, here we see uh, super bright 436 and BV421 uh, uh, base polymer dye uh, being compared to the organic dye eFluor 450. These are all being uh, collected in the same detector of an instrument um, and uh, looking at the same target. So here we're looking at the uh, SCA1 APC as seen on the X axis and on the Y axis C kit uh, conjugated to each of these uh, and then comparing the difference. And you can see that both the uh, super bright and brilliant violet uh, constructs are much brighter than the E floor, uh, the organic uh, dye. Uh, one thing that you do need to be aware of with polymer dyes is if you are using more than one in the same experiment, uh, there can be polymer to polymer interactions. And this does require a special staining buffer to mitigate these interactions. And you can use either uh, a super bright complete staining buffer or a brilliant staining buffer uh, to mitigate these uh, interactions. So some of the advantages is these are just exceptionally bright fluorophores. So they're ideal for labeling low abundance targets. It allows for the addition of fluorophores in previously unused spectral space. Uh, the tandems do have uh, a large stoke shift uh, and just the use of these uh, enable greater multiplexing. And there is uh, antibody conjugate uh, available. Some of the challenges is that, uh, as I mentioned, they need a special buffer when more than one uh, polymer dye are used together. Uh, many of these are tandem constructs, so all of the uh, information around tandems apply to these as well. Uh, if you're making a, an antibody cocktail, it's recommended to use on the day of use, and these are uh, validated for flow cytometry applications. So a new type of foundational dye uses a DNA scaffold. So the Phyton technology uses uh, unique fluorescent dyes that are engineered for excitation, emission, brightness, and stability. So small molecule dyes are precisely positioned on single-stranded DNA oligonucleotides. And then that, this uh, self-assembles to form a remarkably stable DNA structure called the Phyton. And the fluorophores are placed at optimal distances to optimize FRET efficiencies. So different fluorophore choices allow for a variety of excitation and emission combinations, giving uh, a number of unique spectral signatures. And the brightness of the fluorescent label can be modified by adding extra fluorophores to the phyton arms. These are very stable at different temperatures and uh, with fixation. So here we see uh, two of these uh, NovaFluor dyes, as they're called, that use the Phyton technology. And the naming convention is uh, the type of label is NovaFluor. 
um, and then the name of the primary excitation laser is listed, such as blue here, and then a number which corresponds to uh, the maxim, maximum of the emission wavelength. So here we can see an uh, example of how precise this uh, fluorophore design is. And here we can see differences of only 20 nanometers, uh, which make these uh, very uh, useful in spectral flow cytometry applications. As mentioned, the NovaFluor dyes can be engineered to have different levels of brightness within the same spectral signature. And this can be an advantage when building large panels so that you can, you can pair either highly expressed targets or low abundant targets within the same spectral space. Um, the uh, cell blocks blocking buffer is uh, recommended to be used with all NovaFlor conjugates when labeling cells for the best background reduction. And the cell blocks buffer can also be used with any fluorophore antibody conjugate as a, an effective monocyte and macrophage blocking solution. Due to the phyton structure, NovaFlor dyes are not compatible with DNA binding dyes, but the NovaFlor dyes are compatible with amine reactive viability dyes, such as the live dead fixable dead cell stains. Uh, this is a new foundational technology. Currently, there are 19 unique fluorophores uh, with um, direct antibody conjugates and expanding content. So the advantages of uh, the NovaFlor dyes include unique spectral signatures, minimal cross-laser excitation, narrow emissions, uh, and this allows for greater multiplexing with reduced spillover spreading. And the range of brightness uh, can be paired with antigen densities uh, for a strategic panel design. It allows for additional uh, addition of fluorophores in previously unused spectral space, and it, they are compatible with uh, standard workflows. Some of the challenges, uh, we do recommend the use of blocking buffer, uh, cannot be used with DNA binding dyes. Again, if you're going to use antibody cocktails, it's recommended that um, these are used on the same day of being made. Uh, work is in progress for intracellular protocols, and these are validated for flow cytometry applications. And finally, let's take a look at some functional probes. So there are many, many uh, fluorescent probes that are used to access cellular function. Some bind specifically to cellular molecules such as nucleic acids or proteins or lipids, and these increase their fluorescence. Others will uh, accumulate selectively in cell compartments or maybe modify their properties through some specific uh, biochemical reaction in response to changes in the environment, uh, such as a pH or membrane polarization or um, enzymatic activity. So this is uh, showing just a short list of these. So when considering using uh, some of these functional probes in flow cytometry, all of the good practices of use of instrument and panel design are still required. But there are some additional things uh, to consider, which I've highlighted in red here. Uh, for example, uh, what is the type of assay that you're interested in? Uh, will you need to use living cells? or do the cells need to be fixed for the assay? Or can the cells be labeled uh, while living and then fixed? Uh, functional probes uh, generally require um, extra optimization. And um, yes, uh, single color controls are still needed. And all of the controls that you normally would use um, are still needed. 
so here is an example of using one of the basic assays in flow cytometry, identification of dead cells. The most common definition, definition of dead cells is in flow cytometry is when the plasma membrane is compromised. And this can be exploited to identify dead cells. The two common methods, um, one is using an impermeant DNA binding dye, and this is for use with unfixed cells. And then there is the amine reactive dyes, uh, which label unfixed cells, but then can be fixed after labeling. And here's another example. And so this really uh, provides a, a, an example of how knowledge about the specific dye characteristics is important when designing your labeling approach. Um, often called live cell dyes, these cell permeant dyes have different requirements that require optimization on cell type, uh, buffer composition, uh, labeling temperature, uh, labeling time. So it's uh, really important when you're looking at these um, functional dye probes to understand uh, some of these uh, different uh, things and, and questions to ask. So uh, the advantages are, you know, there's a lot of uh, different types of dyes here from UV to intravit to, to infrared. You can do live cells, fixed cells, they may be conjugated. Uh, there's a variety of different applications and these are compatible with many uh, platforms, uh, including uh, flow cytometry, imaging, high content analysis, and image cytometry. Uh, the challenges is that uh, these can be more difficult to multiplex due to the differing labeling conditions and the need to understand individual probes to understand these uh, probe-specific procedures. And these do uh, require some optimization. So that brings us to the end of the presentation, and I'd like to open this up now for questions. Thank you so much, Jolene, for that informative presentation. And we will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions you want to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. And we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's take a look. We already have some great questions coming in, Jolene. Our first question from an audience member, you talked a bit about spectral flow, and I'm hearing it discussed more and more. What is the advantage of using spectral? And the second part of that question, are there instruments that can do both traditional flow and spectral flow? Okay, well, um, uh, great. Um, so you know, full spectrum flow cytometry, um, also referred to as spectral flow. You know, that it's a single cell technology that captures and measures light across this wide emission range for each uh, fluorophore present in the sample. Um, collecting emissions for each fluorophore across multiple ranges uh, rather than, you know, within a single bandpass. And this creates the unique spectral signature uh, that can facilitate differ differentiation of fluorophores with comparable uh, emissions. And in turn, this allows researchers to increase the number of parameters in their multicolor experiments using many of the fluorophores that we have today. And uh, they may be incompatible on a conventional flow cytometer because of the limitation of one fluorophore to one detector. Um, there are many conventional systems in use today, and uh, you know we are seeing uh, adoption of these new spectral systems. There are a few systems available now that can accommodate both um, conventional compensation-based um, and spectrally unmixing uh, detection. Thank you so much. Our next question, 
Why do tandem dyes need lot specific compensation controls? Uh, sure. So uh, to accurately compensate or unmix, it's important to use the same fluorophore used in the multicolor sample as with the single color controls. Um, and in fact, to treat them identically as the multicolor sample. Uh, because a photon transfer efficiency in tandem pairs can differ each time the conjugation is performed, results can uh, vary from lot to lot. Um, so each tandem antibody lot uh, used in an experiment, um, it's recommended to use with its own compensation or unmixing control to ensure that the, the spectral characteristics are identical. And uh, things like, uh, you know, tandem dyes are very susceptible to damage from things like light exposure, uh, and uh, that can cause some variation. So it's best to use the specific tandem dye uh, that uh, you are using for your single color controls. Thank you very much. Now, sometimes I see a mission from the donor dye in my tandem, does that mean the tandem is decoupling? Uh, yeah, so uh, tandem dyes have often been described as degrading or decoupling uh, when describing uh, this loss of emission from the uh, acceptor and increase uh, emission by the donor. However, uh, you know, tandem dyes are covalently attached, so the donor and acceptor do not typically uh, come apart. Um, still, the, the FRET efficiency is never 100%, which means that some fluorescence in the donor detector is expected. Um, there are potentially, though, several causes that can induce the loss of FRET to the acceptor. Um, light exposure is one of these. It, you know, it's also called um, photo bleaching. Um, and this is due to the uh, covalent bond is it being uh, affected. And uh, so it's always important to protect tandem dyes from, from light or other sources of oxidative stress. Um, also, um, exposure to freezing temperatures can result to damage to the protein-based donor fluorophore, um, and uh, fixation can also affect uh, the tandem dye uh, covalent bond quality. Thank you so much. And again, I want to thank our audience for these great questions coming in. Our next one, what is the difference between a tandem dye and a Nova Floor dye. Uh, okay, um, so tandem dyes and the Nova Floor dyes both use FRET, where a, a donor dye is excited and the energy transfers to a close by acceptor dye, and the acceptor dye is then um, admitting the fluorescence. Uh, tandem dyes have two fluorescent molecules joined with a covalent bond. Different from this, uh, the Nova Floor dyes use small fluorescent molecules that are precisely positioned on the uh, DNA strand in the phyton structure. And the phyton is, uh, this structure is very rigid, and it holds the two fluorescent molecules at optimal distance for FRET. So with the phyton structure, there is uh, no covalent bond to disrupt. Thank you so much. Now, it can be difficult to get single FP controls, especially when using multiple FPs together. Is there any way to get around to this? Yeah, so um, for accurate compensation or unmixing, um, a single color control is required. And this includes single fluorescent protein controls as well. There are some vendors that offer um, FP-like beads that uh, these are, you know, modified microspheres that are labeled with a dye that is near identical uh, 
to match uh, specific fluorescent proteins. Uh, now, these work uh, fairly well in compensation-based systems. For spectral systems, they may not be as accurate for unmixing because there are uh, some slight difference in the fluorescent emission from the actual FP. Thank you. Now, what is the size of a phyton? Yeah, so uh, a phyton is uh, 150 kilodaltons in size, and it's uh, something like 20 nanometers across when it's folded into its uh, formation. Thank you. And we have time for two more questions. For those like me beginning to use spectral flow, can you offer some suggestions on how to begin? Yeah, well, there's uh, many resources available. Um, you know, I can uh, suggest you start with your local shared resource laboratory staff or instrument vendor. Uh, both of these can provide training and assistance for using their systems and running experiments and um, selecting uh, reagents. There are publication on panel design and many informative webinars that are available. Uh, many vendors also have a lot of materials available on their websites to help. Uh, things like fluorescence spect reviewers and panel builder tools can be very valuable. Um, another publication that I can call out specifically is the OMIP, O-M-I-P, which stands for Optimized Multicolor Immunophenotyping Panels. Uh, so these are publications with validated panels that have been uh, uh, useful in flow cytometry. And there's um, you know, uh, up to 80 or 70 different panels that have been published and shown to work very well. Um, you might start with a, a modest panel at first, and as you gain experience, you know, maybe grow to larger uh, panels. Thank you so much, Julian. We have time for one more question. This audience member says, could you talk a little bit about the type of reagents used with the Cytoff systems? Hmm. Um, yeah, so um, the Cytoff uh, technology, I mean, it's also called mass cytometry. Um, it is similar to a flow cytometry, uh, but I didn't talk about these systems today because they are not fluorescence based. Um, uh, this uses an, a, a single cell, uh, single cells are in suspension with this technology and uh, they're labeled with metal tagged reagents that use um, uh, stable isotopes that are not normally found in biological systems. Uh, but they are detected using uh, you know, like a high resolution mass uh, spectrometry system. So there's many similarities between uh, the CYTEF technology and flow cytometry, but it does not use fluorescence. Jolene, I want to thank you for your time today and for your work. I also want to take the time to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. And before we go, I want to thank our audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions, questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand Labrador will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care, everyone. Stay safe. Bye-bye.